Hello and welcome to the Will Preach for Food podcast. I'm Doug. I work at Faith Lutheran Church in Shelton, Washington. Hey, thanks so much for tuning in today. This podcast is going out for Palm Sunday, April 5th. And we're in that sort of weird place where none of us is really sure how this coronavirus thing is going to play out. Well, in uncertain times like this, the Bible tells us that no matter what, we can put our hope in God. And in fact, as we do that, not only does God answer our prayer, but God also uh, helps us to grow in faith and love and courage and compassion. So that's what we're going to look at today. As always, you're going to want to have your Bible handy. There are some podcast notes below where you'll find links to some of our worship and study and devotional resources. But by the end of this podcast, I hope that you're encouraged and challenged, maybe a little bit closer to Jesus, and certainly better equipped for the week ahead. Let's start with prayer. Into your spacious heart and loving hands, dear God, I place my fears, my what-ifs, my spinning world and mind. Comfort me with the truth that no fear is too big for the great one who is always with me. I am never alone. O calming God, bring courage tender spirit, breathe peace. Gentle Jesus, be close. Amen. We'll open your Bible first to John chapter 12, verses 12 through 19. This is the start of Holy Week, the last few days of Jesus' earthly ministry. He had recently drawn attention for raising Lazarus from the dead and now found himself in the middle of a crowd wanting, him, wanting to crown him king. The story mentions palm branches being waved during his entrance into Jerusalem, and that's how this day became known as Palm Sunday. By Thursday, we, re we will recall that the Last Supper, the night in which Jesus was betrayed, that night he'll be arrested and tried. By Friday noon, he'll be crucified on a cross. Good Friday gets its name to mark the good news that God would suffer and die to demonstrate God's love for you and for me and for all creation. We'll count Friday, Saturday, and the third day is Easter Sunday, the morning the tomb is found empty, that Christ has been risen from the dead. So we read from John chapter 12. It says, The next day the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Blessed is the King of Israel! Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had performed this sign, went out to meet him. And so the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. You know, it strikes me, over the centuries, we've turned Palm Sunday and the rest of, the, of Holy Week into a very ritualized, predictable routine. We wave palm branches on Sunday, we buy Easter lilies, we have the youth group plan the breakfast and get volunteers to organize the Easter egg hunt. We strip the altar on Monday, Thursday, we sing the cantata on Good Friday, and we remind everybody to invite their friends and neighbors to Easter Sunday morning services. But the first Holy Week was anything but planned. Nobody knew what was gonna happen. Word about Jesus was spreading, you might say it was spreading like a virus, and it was adding pressure to an already anxious political situation. The crowds were hoping for Jesus to be a new king who would bring revolution and change. The religious leaders at the time were hoping that A, the crowds did not, would not attract the attention of the Roman soldiers, and B, that this whole Jesus thing would just blow over and things would go back to the way they were. I mean, we're kind of in that kind of no man's land today, aren't we? 
We're hoping that we can flatten the curve on this virus. We're not sure if it's going to work. Some hope that we'll emerge out of this with, a, I don't know, a better healthcare system or a kinder, gentler nation. Some people just want everything to go back to the way it was before. Here's the thing about Palm Sunday. Where is God when there's a crisis? Well, the answer is smack dab in the middle of it, usually bearing the brunt of the worst of the damage. God in Christ became one of us, the Bible says, parked in the middle of our mess. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. God came down to earth. And what does that mean for us? It means that God meets us where we are, as we are. And so where is God right now? Well, God is right here beside every laid off teacher, every overworked medical professional, every COVID-19 patient, every breaking marriage and out of control teenager. Be not afraid, daughters and sons. See your King Jesus has shown up riding on a donkey. We put our hope in God because God meets us in our suffering and anxiety. Not only is God with us, but it turns out the su that suffering is a place where we also grow and learn to be more like God and to participate in God's saving activity. Turn now in your Bible to Romans chapter 5, the first verse. Paul writes, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Now, just a few things about this passage that catches my attention. First, how Paul starts with our identity in Christ. In Christ, God has already justified us, declared a peace treaty, given us access to the unconditional love of God in which we all stand. And Paul ends this passage with the assurance that the Holy Spirit has already been lavished upon us, poured out abundantly. The love of God is for us and in us, and it is pure gift. That middle section is so evocative. Suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character. Character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame. Suffering here is sometimes translated tribulation. It really has to do with being in a tight spot being under pressure, hum hemmed in, our backs up against a wall. Paul says that as Christians, we boast in our sufferings. That is, we can hold our heads up high with God-given confidence that in the midst of challenges and uncertainty, God is with us. We have everything that we need. The endurance or perseverance, that's being steady under pressure. It's being resilient, resourceful patient. And that leads to character, that ability to be found trustworthy or dependable. To have, to have character is to be known as someone who's cool under pressure, reliable in a crisis, level-headed. A person of good character is one who acts with integrity for the good of others. This person is noble, compassionate. And hope, then, Hope is the expectation of a good result or positive outcome. Hope is related to trust and patience. Some of the Psalms in the Old Testament talk about waiting for the Lord. This is what hope is. It is finally and simply hope in God. Trusting that God is good. God's creation is good. And God's will for us and for all people is good. Because God is good. We have hope. That's why I'm very skeptical whenever somebody jumps up and labels the latest natural disaster or political crisis as punishment from God. After all, the Bible asserts again and again that God promises to show up in times of adversity. The Christian tradition has seen suffering and crises as time for growth and compassion. 
In Jesus, we see God's tendency to create, bring life, rescue, save, heal, forgive, and raise the dead. You know, when I was a hospice chaplain, once I was sitting at the bedside of a patient, she was dying of cancer. It was a hard day for her. And finally, in a moment of pain, she was scared. She, she looked at me and she said, Chaplain, I think God is punishing me. <laughs> well, I looked at her with feigned horror. Wow, I said, what did you do? <laughs> Surprised by my response, she immediately shook her head and she said, well, nothing that bad. Then it probably isn't punishment, I told her. I smiled and gently squeezed her hand. And we continued our conversation. And before I left the room, we prayed to God to give us strength and hope for the challenges and fears of the day. Now, is there punishment for sin? Sure. Are there consequences for bad behavior? Usually. But my point is this. It is a very tricky thing to try to assess why we've got this pandemic thing going on. So much of life is simply circumstance and necessary consequences for personal and collective decisions made over the course of days, years, decades, and centuries that may or may not be anything that we can affect. And some things that feel like punishment at first end up bringing about a better future. What is punishment? What's a blessing in disguise? What's an unanswered prayer and what's an answer to a better, deeper, unspoken prayer? That's why the Bible teaches us to put our hope in God alone and not in external circumstances or internal feelings. Again, the Apostle Paul, this time in Philippians 4, says this as he reflects on a lifetime of living in the faithfulness and hope of God. He writes in Philippians chapter 4, verse 11, I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Look, the Apostle Paul isn't perfect, and we can debate all day some of his attitudes and assumptions, but Paul gets this. Hope and contentment and joy come from a relationship with God, not from outside circumstances. Look, this whole virus thing is really hard. My heart goes out to, to so many folks. We're talking about hundreds and thousands of deaths in the United States and across the world. There is literally no end in sight. Maybe the restrictions can ease up by the first part of May or June, but every indication is that this thing is around for good and that we're going to go through seasons of higher infection rates, which will require renewed restrictions. Look, as a pastor, I'm really not sure we'll ever get back to a normal that somehow involves regularly large groups of people congregating on a weekly basis with coffee and cookies in hand. And it's worse for people who've lost jobs, who can't pay rent, whose lives and livelihood are in jeopardy. People whose lives are already right on the edge. <laughs> Marriages breaking up, addictions and mental health illness, cancer and dementia, estranged children, melting glaciers, partisan politics, profound loneliness and for the victims of the disease itself, the fear, the pain, the suffering. I'm sorry. Maybe all this craziness and suffering can help us better relate to the first Palm Sunday. When everything was up in the air, when no one knew how things were gonna turn out, Half the people were praying for revolution. Half the people were praying that everything would go just back to the way it was. Sisters and brothers, put your hope in God. God is here. God is with us. God always shows up in times of difficulty. You and I, we belong to God, and the cross is proof and demonstration that nothing can separate you from the love of God. You have been chosen, justified,
forgiven, filled, and sent. So as you put your hope in God this day, here are four characteristics of what that hope might look like in your life. First of all, be honest. Be honest about your own suffering and don't discount the sufferings of others. My boss back in my hospice days taught me that pain is whatever the patient says it is, wherever the patient says it is. Pain and suffering are real. Ask yourself and ask others around you, what is hardest for you right now? And then listen. Second thing is be kind. <laughs> How many of you have received a wellness phone call from someone this week? What a blessing it is when someone shares in our troubles. How many of you have, have made some of those calls? I was talking with one member of this congregation who said that she and her husband make three or four phone calls every noon hour to people they think might just like a call. What a gift that is. Way to go. So be honest, be kind, and frankly, folks, be quiet. <laughs> Let's stop the blame game. Everybody wants to blame somebody for everything. Don't blame the president or the press. Don't point fingers at China or millennials. Don't blame God and don't blame toilet paper hoarders, okay? Let's be honest, let's be kind, let's be quiet, and then finally, let's be open. What is God teaching us? What is God teaching you? Is there something that you're being invited to give up? Are there ways that you can become more compassionate, more useful? Do you have resources that you can share? You know, on Facebook, I saw that my old stomping ground, Marcus Daly Memorial Hospital in Hamilton, Montana, was calling on local quilting groups to sew face masks for hospital personnel. Could you do that? Could your congregation do that? Could Faith Lutheran Church do that uh, for people in our community or our hospital? Is that a way that we could be the church, the church of the God who shows up? Let's be open to new ways of being and doing God's will. Come, Holy Spirit, as the song says, melt me, mold me, fill me, use me. And let's end today's message once again with Paul's encouragement from Romans chapter 5. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Hey, thanks for listening to this week's We'll Preach for Food podcast. I hope it's sparked some conversation, given you some encouragement for the week ahead. Put your hope in God and remember to be kind and stay healthy. I should mention that we have some additional resources coming soon to the website, www.faithshelton.org, uh, coming up for Holy Week and for Easter. Send us your email and contact information to get the latest. Shout out to Chaz for his production work on this podcast. You can access other episodes through our website. You can also subscribe to this podcast through Apple Podcasts or Google Podcasts or any other way you listen to podcasts. Don't forget to like us and while you're at it, post a comment. Love to hear from you. Share this link with a friend or better yet, call a friend right now. Find a way to share with them a word of hope. Today's blessing are two more verses from the book of Romans. The first is Romans 12:12. 12, 12. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, and faithful in prayer. And finally, from Romans chapter 15, verse 13, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in God, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.